بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجال كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وكلوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم من يتي الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد My dear brothers and sisters, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, I'm very grateful to be here once again to reflect with you on the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'd like to remind myself first and foremost, and then all of you watching and listening, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala invites all of us to Islam. So how do we know that this beautiful religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is called Islam? We also learned this from the Quran. It is revealed to us in Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse number three, Al-Yawma aklamtu lakum dinukum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati Today I have perfected your faith for you, completed my favor upon you, and chosen Islam as your way. And the Quran is the guidance given to all of humanity for the sole purpose of bringing us closer to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and by extension, all of us coming closer together in character and deeds that are pleasing to our creator. The root word of the Quran is Qaf Ra Hamza, or Qara which has a meaning of recitation or to read. From among the earliest verses revealed to our Prophet Sallallahu the first verses that are widely believed to be recited first are Iqra, Bismi Rabbika Lazi Khalaq, Khalq al-Insana min alaq, Iqra wa Rabbukal Akram. Read, O Prophet, in the name of your Lord who created humans from a clinging cloth. Read, Iqra, as your Quran is the most generous. And we've all heard this verse many, many times over. And this verse is in chapter number 96 called Surah Al-Alaq. While the first chapter in the Quran, as we all know it, is Surah Al-Fatiha. So among the 114 chapters we know in the Quran, Surah Al-Fatiha is the first one that we find in it. But chronologically speaking, the verses in Surah Al-Alaq is what is what was first revealed. Now, why should this matter to anyone just starting to read the Quran? And it shouldn't. It shouldn't. But what it should highlight for us is that the history of the Quran, knowing it a little bit more than just what is in the Quran, helps us give, help us ha have a greater appreciation uh, for the depth that is in the Quran. So the Quran means recitation. And broadly speaking, when we transmit knowledge to one another, that either takes place through writing or by oral transmission or both. And as the Quran was being revealed, it was being committed by me to memory by many of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu And there were scribes at that time too who were writing the verses down for the Prophet Sallallahu And one of those scribes was Zayd ibn Thabit. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with him. And Zayd ibn Thabit was the personal scribe to the Prophet Sallallahu and worked closely with the Prophet um, when it came to even matters of politics or talking or writing letters to uh, other nations or other leaders. And he was one of the people who memorized and recorded the verses of the Quran as well. And it wasn't until our Prophet ﷺ passed away in the six in 632 of the Common Era that the Khulafa or the Caliphates, they began to compile or have a sense of urgency to compile all these verses into a book because the fear and concern was that we would lose all of this information after the companions also passed away. So Zayd ibn Thabit was given this responsibility by the, by the first caliph uh, to actually go ahead and, and compile all of this information into a book. And this work doesn't come to completion until the caliphate of Uthman, the third caliph. So how do we know to call the book of Allah the Quran? And this is another miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We find this also in the Quran. And we learn this in 70 different places in the Quran. And one of these verses in the Quran you can find in Surah Zumar, where Allah says, We have certainly set forth every kind of lesson for every people in this Quran, so perhaps they will be mindful. And that word mindful 
is a very popular term in our zeitgeist, not just today, but has been for a few years now. And here in this verse, Allah is telling us that there is guidance in the Quran for everyone, not just those who believe in Islam and follow Islam. But Allah says, وَلَقَدْ ذَرَبْنَا لِلنَّاسِ And لِلنَّاسِ means everyone, regardless of their belief. So here Allah is telling everyone that if you're mindful, and mindful implies that a person has an awareness about themselves, about their thoughts and their actions, then there's guidance for them in the Quran. لَأَلَّهُمْ يَتَذَكَّرُونَ And tazakkar is part of being reflective uh, on yourself, part of being you know, a thoughtful person. And as humans, we are guided by our desires. You know, there's absolutely no hiding that. We all know this. And if we're going to follow the being of Allah, if we're being told, yes, you have to follow this path or you should follow this path and this path being Islam, then we need to be taught and we need to see examples to be guided. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only gave us guidance in the form of the Quran, he gave us the best of examples to follow. And that is our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa We do also follow examples of the other Prophets. But Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was the one who, was, who received the revelation of the Quran. In fact, the idolaters of the time, the Quraysh, they used to make fun of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and his companion at every opportunity they could find. And it's reported in one of the ahadiths that one of these idolaters made fun of the companions by saying, your companion, meaning the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa even teaches you how to go to the toilet. Think about that for a moment. We are more than 1400 years since the revelation of the Quran living in an advanced society, we're using toilet paper instead of water to clean ourselves is considered good enough after going to the toilet. And I won't go deep into that because I know you take my point. But the point is, all of these things, these little details were intentionally taught to the people of uh, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu at the time, because these were things that they didn't do even then. So going back to the names of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, how do we know the names of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala? And we know this also from the Quran. You know, while the list differs sometimes with the 99 names, there's at least 70 or 80 of those names that consistently appear in all of those lists. And this too is described to us in the Quran about the different names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we are first introduced to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran as Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim, the most compassionate and the most merciful. So whenever we start to recite any chapter, with the exception of Surah Toba, we begin with, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the most compassionate, most merciful. The very first line in Surah Fatiha starts with that. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And this brings me to the attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I wanted to share with you today. And that attribute is al rauf the all pity. And this name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is closely related to ar-Rahim, the most merciful. So going back to the language piece of this, the root word of Ar-Rauf is Ra, Hamza, Fa, or Ra'fa. And depending on the context in which you use it, it has meanings of kindness, pity, or compassion. So if you think of the English language, pity and compassion are synonymous to each other, and so is kindness. Imam Ghazali, in his um, you know, discussion, in his book on the 99 names of Allah, mentions that this attribute is a more emphatic version than Ar-Rahim. Meaning, if you take the word ar-Rahim or rahma, this is an intensification of mercy or rahma. So, what is the difference between rahma and rafa? And there are several subtle differences. One of these differences is that rafa is the highest level of mercy. So, if al rauf is the highest level of mercy that Allah subhanahu wa taala shows His creations, you know, another difference is rahma is after uh, calamity has struck while Rafa is before the calamity has struck. So let's take an example to illustrate this point. So if there's a child and this child is frostbitten after being outdoors in the winter for a long time without proper clothing, then showing mercy to this child or rahma to this child would be to treat this child for their frostbite and other injuries that they may have sustained by being out in the cold and not being properly equipped. So Comforting this child and helping this child heal through their injury is showing mercy. On the other hand, Rafa would be to give the child the necessary clothing, a jacket, gloves, hat, anything they might need to protect themselves while they're outside so that they don't develop any frostbite in the first place. So Rafa refers to the outwardly act of compassion and kindness 
which is accompanied by gentleness. So in our example, giving the child gloves, jacket, etc., keep them warm is an act of compassion. So the child doesn't have frostbite. So we don't want any harm to come to the child. However, in the case of Rahma, mercy, we can show mercy even while we're being harsh. So let's take this example further. If a mother becomes stern with their child when the child is sick, and the child then absolutely just refuses to take their medicine, and the mother becomes harsh, mother says, no, you have to take this medicine. But the child is just not seeing any reason behind it. But that mother is still showing mercy, even though the child is refusing to take the medicine. So recognizing that Rahma can happen even when we are being harsh and Rafa is that concern that having that compassion before we know something bad that could happen. So from you know that example, the child might think, well, my mom is just being unreasonable, but the mother knows best. She knows that this child needs this medicine to get better. And we've all likely heard that crying of the child, you know, and we know that it tugs at our heart. But if that medicine is the difference between the child getting better and not getting better, it doesn't matter what the child does. We will impose that medicine on that child or a mother will impose that medicine on that child. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us that compassion. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy is all inclusive. You know, even when we are ungrateful, you know, we squander, when we squander blessings every day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still has concern for us. You know, when we... If we have wealth and we squander a portion of it, let's say on gambling and something that is prohibited, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, reminding us that we are being ungrateful by actually taking the blessing that we have been provided and squandering it away. And the same thing could be said about you know, having a skill or a talent and then putting it to use on something that is, again, prohibited. So for us to avoid making these mistakes, we need to be guided. We need to be reminded. We need to be told that these are the things you need to stay away from because it not only harms you, it also then harms your community and ultimately it harms everybody else in your community and around you. So those warnings are what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving to us in the Quran. And when we read the Quran, you know, we learn many different types of things to stay away from. We also learn how to act and how to behave. And then the example, exemplification of that is also in the life of the Prophet sallallahu how he treated his neighbors, his companions, the other leaders from other nation states, how he negotiated uh, and even lived his own personal life with the wealth that he, he had a small amount of money and he would always just give it away, how he lived his life with simplicity. So the Quran not only tells us the consequences of the disobedience, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also gives us the warning that saying, stop before you even do it. You know, it would be too much for us to bear if the only thing Allah subhanahu wa told us in the Quran was about punishment. I mean, who would want to hear just about punishment and living in fear all the time? You know, that is not how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has communicated all of this to us. Allah tells us why even in many of those instances. And Allah is not only showing us compassion and pity, but Allah is telling us that you should live your life with mercy. You know, you should take these and act upon them. So, to help us stay away from disobedience that will harm us in this world and the hereafter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the manual, which is the Quran, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us a prophet, uh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who even in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls mercy for this world. And we find this in Surah Al-Anbiya, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةٌ لِلْعَالْمِينَ We have sent you a prophet only as a mercy for the whole world. رَحْمَةٌ لِلْعَالْمِينَ all, all of this world. So for us to understand Arauf, let's let's about uh, let's um, think about this from a grander perspective. Let's think about this um, more holistically. So our Prophet ﷺ informs us in an authentic hadith that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala created a hundred mercies, and He placed one mercy among His creation, and they show mercy to one another by it. And there are ninety nine mercies with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and we find this hadith in uh, Tirmidhi. So on a cold night when a mother covers her child in a blanket or when a deer covers its young calf with its body or when a bird sits over an egg or eggs to keep them warm before they hatch. This is just one part of the one mercy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us. And the rest are kept with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
or the day of judgment. There's another hadith that makes reference to the day of judgment with respect to the same hadith. So if we focus intensely on the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we realize that every word in the Quran is mercy because every letter comes from al rauf So think about it. One of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ar rahim So you've done something, now you have Allah's mercy even that follows it. You know, if you come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But before you even go down that path, Allah is al rauf So Allah is warning you to not go down that path. So we start with the recitation of the Quran in the name of Allah. The one who sent us the messenger, the one who sent us the message with the rahmah. And in another authentic hadith, the Prophet ﷺ tells us that no fatigue, nor disease, nor sorrow, nor sadness, nor hurt, nor distress befalls a Muslim, even if we were the prick he receives from a thorn. But that Allah expiates some of his sins for that. So what the Prophet ﷺ is telling us that Allah's mercy is there even when we are feeling that pain. And all of Allah's mercy is so that we can all realize our place in Jannah subhanahu wa in, in, in Jannah. So why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not want us to be in Jannah if Allah isn't giving us those warning signs, if Allah isn't telling us that, you know, uh, repent to me, come back to me. All of those are signs for us to know that, you know, Allah is there to catch us when there's nobody else to catch us, right? Otherwise, why would Allah tell us about His mercy? Why would Allah tell us about Jannah and invite us to this beautiful place you know, a place that uh, the Prophet ﷺ describes in another authentic hadith that, you know, Allah says, I have prepared for my righteous slave such excellent things as no eye has ever seen, nor an ear has ever heard, nor a human heart can ever think of. So things that we can only imagine or not even imagine, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying is waiting for us over there. And we all make dua to enter such a place. You know, we're given excellent things from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has given us the ability to use our hands, our feet, to generate income, to do useful things, a mind to think about problems and solve them. You know, and we desire nothing more than, than being in that place of comfort with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. Yet the hardships we experience in this world make us forget that there is a reward for those of us who live a life seeking the pleasure of Allah, even in the face of hardship. Sometimes it is difficult for us um, when we are faced with challenges to stop for a minute and just reflect on it. And our Prophet ﷺ tells us about a person who lived the most miserable life in this world who will be brought to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. And Allah would ask this person, you know, after being dipped in paradise and, and, and ask him, oh son of Adam, did you face any hardship? And this person would say, by Allah, no, my Lord, never did I face any hardship or experience any distress in this world. So the Rafa of Allah, the Rafa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us how to be at our best behavior in this world. Even when there's calamity in front of us, even when we face extreme challenges and difficulties in front of us, even when we can't explain why something is happening to us or why we are made to face such difficulties and the uncertainties that come along with it. We should always remember that Sayyid Alullahi Ba'da Usran Busra. After hardship, Allah will bring about ease. Sayyid alullahu ba'da usrin busra. And on the day of judgment, you know, we'll all be asked about what we did in this world, how we acted when we were presented with temptation, how we struggled with difficulty, how we lived when we were with ease, how we spent the wealth we were given, how we took care of those who were in need, how we used the knowledge that we were provided with. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al rauf is showing us the way to live a life that is purposeful, even when we falter. And that is an important point to keep in mind. Even when we falter, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not far away. He subhanahu wa ta'ala is al rauf and al rahim Before and after you do something, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there to catch you. And this is available to all of us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate our understanding of the Quran so that we may live our lives under the guidance of Allah and not based on the guidance of our own desires because that too is very easy to do. And may Allah increase us in knowledge and give us wisdom that gives us the ability to apply this knowledge when we need it most.
my dear brothers and sisters, I seek forgiveness from Allah for me and for you and to the rest of the Muslims. So ask him for forgiveness. He is the forgiver, the merciful. Um, my dear brothers and sisters, I, I always like to think about how do we apply this knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us in the Quran? How do we take examples of the Prophet sallallahu and make it actionable for ourselves uh, in our everyday life? We live in a time that is very different from that of the prophets and the companions. And the more technically we get advanced as a nation, as a society, as a, as a world, the more difficult it becomes to you know, stay in touch with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because our attention span seems to be reducing uh, with every decade, it seems. Um, more so after COVID, I have no idea why, but I can guess why. So one way to do this is, you know, to reflect on al rauf is to have mercy on others, you know, treat others in the manner that we would want to be treated in a way that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of us would call that the golden rule, you know, treat others as you would like to be treated. It is recorded in uh, Sahih al-Bukhari that our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, you know, he is not merciful to others. Um, he who is not merciful to others will not be treated mercifully. Another way we can uh, take this attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to you know, increase mercy in our own hearts. Uh, when we focus on ourselves and our problems, we quickly forget that there is a wider community outside that needs some form of help. And we forget that there are people in this world who are suffering oppression by no fault of their own. When we don't think about the others who are suffering, we harden our heart to their plight. We become numb to their own suffering because we are lost in our own thoughts. So to better ourselves and to live this attribute, we should remind ourselves to pray for those who are in need when we are not able to aid them directly and to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help those who are in some form of difficulty or oppression and to free them from their difficulty and oppression when we're not able to save them ourselves. And we should make time and volunteer in our community so that we can connect with the hardship that is in our community and empathize with those who are in need because not all problems that we can help and solve with needs to be global problems. You know, our communities in our own cities, in our own neighborhoods also need that same help. And lastly, the way we can apply this in our lives is, you know, to just be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the blessings that we receive today and give ourselves the same grace and mercy that we would want to extend to others. Because we too are not perfect and we are not perfect beings by any stretch of the imagination. We never will be. So before going to bed, I remind myself to spend five minutes taking stock of the day that I had and think about the things that I could have done differently. And then ask Allah very explicitly about how I could use some guidance, how I could use his mercy. You know, thinking about the things, maybe I did something that I know and recognize in hindsight may have been hurtful to someone. So asking Allah directly for the things that we didn't do so well is being graceful to ourselves and just letting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala handle it for us and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for our lack of awareness and for the things that we may have done either knowingly or unknowingly. And so inshallah khair, may Allah accept all of our du'as, may Allah accept all of our guidance and may Allah increase us in orientation towards him. Ameen. Allahumma ameen. Let's just make a du'a and uh, close this khutbah inshallah. Inna al-Muslimina wa muslimat والمؤمنين والمؤمنات والقانتين والقانتات والصادقين والصادقات والصابرين والصابرات والخاشئين والخاشيات والمتصدقين والمتصدقات والصائمين والصائمات والحافظين وفروجهم والحافظات وذاكرين الله كثيرا والذاكرات عد الله لهم مغفرة وأجر عظيمة ربنا حب لنا من أزواجنا وزرياتنا كرة أيون يوم وأجلنا للمتقين إماما ربنا فاغفر لنا زنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار Rabbi Jalni Mukimu Salati Wamin Zuriati Rabbana Takabal Dua Rabbana La Tuzi Kulubana Bada is Hadaytana Wahablana Minna Dunka Rahmatun Inna Innaka Anta Wahab Rabbana Aleka Tawakana Waileka Nabna Waleka Masir Rabbana Zalamna and Fusana Wailam Takfilana Wa Tahamna Al Nakuna Mina Khasri Inna Laha Yamuru Bil Adi Wal Ahsani Wa Ita is Al Kurba Wiyanha in Il Fashai Wal Munkari Wal Bari Yazukum Lala Kum Tazakarun La Ilaha Ilam Tasubhanaka and Yukun to Mirazalameen Subhanahu rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh